Welcome back to the Heat Seekers podcast. After some technical difficulties, we finally got this shit fixed. It was frustrating. <laughs> I said all kinds of cuss words off air. Um, maybe if I can find that, if we have it saved anywhere, I will uh, put up a blooper reel. Um, but it'll definitely have that explicit content tag on it. Um, Anyways, we are here tonight to talk about the Detroit Lions and all things fantasy football. So uh, if you've got some Lions on your radar and you're wondering how are they going to do in redraft or how are they going to do in the future for my dynasty team, I've got the resident Canadian Sully from Sully's Two Cents um, on the podcast today to help out. I've got Brad Menendez Straight from Detroit. Actually, he's in Fort Wayne now, but he's from Detroit, and he's a big Lions <laughs> fan. So uh, hopefully he's got a lot of information for us coming out of Detroit Lions training camp. Um, if you want to tune in, you can watch live on YouTube or Twitch or in our Facebook group. All you got to do is go to rotoheat.com slash Twitch, rotoheat.com slash YouTube. That can get you to those channels. If you're on Facebook, just search rotoheat and you can find us. Um, If you want to listen to this on podcast, right now we are on Spotify and Podbean, and we are just waiting approval on Google, on iTunes, on uh, Stitcher, so there will be some options for you guys that like the podcast. Um, we're going to get right into this. Brad, who do you want to talk about first, buddy? So um, I just want to kind of set the stage real quick. Uh, you know, Detroit's getting a new offensive system with Daryl Bevel coming in. Um, and I want to temper expectations. You know, everybody knows that he is successful in his stops in Seattle and in Minnesota. Uh, but it took a season before the offense really started to pick things up. So before we start talking about quarterbacks, you know, uh, they are a very run heavy offense. They, or they will be, um, but it's going to take some time before you really see a lot of return on the value. But that being said, uh, let's start quarterbacks because everybody wants to know about Stafford and, and if he's fallen off or if he's going to return to being a QB one. Well, why don't we just shoot that right over to Rob and Rob, why don't you let us know? If you think that the, what is it, 159 Superflex ADP, um, this is Dynasty ADP for anybody listening, um, or the 100 in regular PPR ADP is either undervalued or overvalued for Matt Stafford, and where do you see him finishing in 2019? I think he's undervalued, and I think that Stafford historically has been a rather safe uh, dynasty or you know quarterback in fantasy. I do think that the transition in the offense is going to affect him a little bit. But my experience with Bevel as a Vikings fan is he tends to get the best out of the talent that he has around him. So if there's an opportunity for them to throw the ball, they're absolutely going to. Um, you know Stafford, I don't see him as a top 12 quarterback. Really like him in a super flex. Uh, he can be a nice addition to your team. But in a one QB league. He's probably going to be, if he's going to be on my roster, he's going to be on my bench most weeks. But uh, with that being said, I do think he's undervalued. He played most of last year with a broken back. So I think that influenced his downturn in his season. But I like him. I think he's viable quarterback in this league. Yeah, I would I would tend to agree, which I don't have a problem with waiting till you know, 159 in a regular PPR league and drafting him as my QB one also like in, in, in a one QB league, if he's, if I'm streaming QBs, I have no problem using him during good matchups. Obviously there are four in division games that make it real tough to, to start him with uh, the two against Chicago and two against Minnesota. And, and honestly, the, the, the Packers defense could be better this year too. So, um, the in division games get tough, but there will be some matchups out of division um, that I think he could excel in. So I don't have a problem doing that. Um, I don't know. Like I definitely think that he's undervalued in super flex. We've seen like Philip Rivers was going around the same range as him in in ADP in uh, super flex, but like or in uh, regular. But in Superflex, he was like 30 picks ahead of him, I think. 
So it's weird how their value is like oh, the same in one QB, but then Philip Rivers gets this huge um, separation when it comes to to Superflex. So I think he's definitely undervalued there going at pick 100. If you can get him in that 70 range where I think uh, Rivers was like in the 60s, I feel like that's more where he should be um, just based off of value in comparison with, with Rivers. So I definitely do think he's undervalued. Um, Brad, where are you taking him? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I in Superflex, I would take him a little earlier. You know, I'm probably around the Phillip Rivers range as well. You know, the, the cool thing about Stafford is week one, he's probably going to come out of the gate and look really good against a really porous Cardinals defense. But then he's going to be facing a really tough weeks two through, you know, six. I mean, like Chargers, Eagles, Chiefs. I mean, there, there's a, a lot of tough teams that he's going to be facing. So, you know, I would temper my expectations on him, you know. So I would take him after a guy like Rivers. You know, I look at him as kind of a back, uh, high-end QB2 this year, you know, so probably in the 70s to 80s range, um, you know, with the hopes that there's going to be weeks that he's going to have really nice numbers because he's healthy. You know, all the reports out of training camp and, and everything that I've been hearing and reading and seeing from everybody I've talked to, which when I say everybody that I talk to, I do have a couple of friends that are that are writers in the Detroit area. So I'm talking to people that are actually there, not just, uh, you know, pie in the sky people. They say he looks healthy. You know, he looks good. He's throwing the ball. He's got good zip. You know, the back is completely healed. So I wouldn't be afraid to take him as my as my QB one if you're looking for a value. Um, you know, but I would temper my expectations at least this year. Yeah, I just definitely think in a in a one QB league, like let everybody else overdraft their quarterbacks mm -hmm. and and wait until that you know fourteenth fifteenth round. And, and get a guy like Stafford um, and, and another guy back there and then just stream them um, and just save yourself the headache of, you know, not having enough depth at wide receiver and running back. Um, <clears throat> all right, Brad, I'm, I'm going to let you lead us into, uh, well, first of all, are there any backup quarterbacks that we should even have an eye on if we're looking for a stash? I know there is some talk that this could potentially be Stafford's last year in Detroit. Um, so if, if that's the case, is there somebody backing him up now that could be the starter in 2020 for dynasty purposes, or is it going to come in a draft or in free agency? The, the funniest thing to me is, is you could see Detroit go with somebody like Fromm from Georgia, you know, and we could see another Matthew Stafford all over again. I mean, cause Fromm really is very similar. There's nobody on the roster currently though that that really does anything. You know, they're talking about Tom Savage as the backup. I mean, it feels very reminiscent of last year with um, you know, Matt Castle and Jake Rudock. I mean, just a bunch of kind of guys. Um, so no, I wouldn't I wouldn't be looking anywhere anywhere after that, you know. And as we saw, Stafford's going to play even if he's hurt. I mean, and, and for whatever that's worth. Yeah, he's definitely a tough guy. I just, you know, with all that talk about this potentially being his last year, I was wondering if uh, we could sneak in a 2020 Superflex quarterback um, by grabbing him now before the season starts in 2019. That's obviously the best way to go, if possible, get that quarterback for cheap. Yeah, it, feel, it feels very much like this is kind of a make-or-break year. You know, with the contract, they can get out of it next year. Um, he's still got a little bit of time left on there. Uh, but money-wise, they can get out without having to spend uh, an arm and a leg. I don't have over the cap up right now, but this year, if they got out of his contract, I mean, it was like twenty plus million that they would have to take it, and they would have to eat for a while. So, um, yeah, I would, I would, I if I'm Detroit, you know, you've got to look at some of these quarterbacks coming up because Stafford's not getting any younger. But you know, I could very much if Detroit doesn't really take major steps forward this year, I mean, they could just blow this whole thing up, and I wouldn't be upset about that. <laughs> All right. So, who are we going to talk about next? Are we going to talk about running backs or wide receivers? Where are we going to go? You know what? Let's uh, because it was it was such a, a a bad position last year. We'll go to the tight ends next. Um, you know, I, everything that I've heard, Detroit had their scrimmage uh, over the weekend, um, and it's not the first time I've been hearing positive news about the tight ends. You know, Hawkinson has come in and looked like a man amongst boys. Uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of Detroit fans, you know. We took Ebron early. We took Brandon Pettigrew all those years back in the first round. 
people are kind of nervous about Detroit and tight ends in the first round, but Hawkinson is just so much. I mean, his he catches the ball very well. He's not been dropping a lot of balls. I mean, if you watched the Hall of Fame game at all, you know Noah Fant looked a bit a bit flustered out there. He kept he dropped a few that he really should have had. You know, Hawkinson looks complete opposite. He's catching everything. Somebody have their sound on? Uh, Might have been me, boss. Dang. I mean, them them Canadians, you got to watch them. Um, Can't trust us. <laughs> Rob, while we're uh, talking to you, why don't you fill us yeah. in on uh, what you think about this tight end position in Detroit? And are you a big TJ Hawkinson fan? I think TJ Hawkinson's a hell of a player, and I think he's going to be down the road. Um I don't know what to expect out of him in year one. I think that he will be good, but he's not going to be too impactful. Uh, you know, again, Daryl Bevel got Vicente Shanko to be relevant in fantasy back in the day in Minnesota. So I do think it's a component of their offense. I do think if he's going to do a lot of damage, it's probably down in the red zone. One thing that might hurt him a little bit is he's a really good blocker. And in a run-heavy, run-first offense, if they want to run the ball, they're going to leverage his ability to block, keep him on the inside. And if they run two tight end sets, I don't know if it's Jesse James that leaks out, but uh, he's definitely someone you want to own. I think his IDP rate, or sorry, his ADP right now, I believe he's tight end nine, which is a little bit high for me. Uh, but the kid can flat out play. He's going to be a player. I, I wouldn't worry about the Pettigrew and Ebron comparisons. He's legit. Yeah, if you are, if you're a fan of OJ Howard, then I feel like you should be a, f- a fan of TJ Hawkinson. I totally think they true. are they are very similar. They are both um, very good all around tight ends. They can block. They can catch. They're athletic. Um, I am the guy that tends to get a little bit worried about good blocking tight ends because the the more you're blocking, then the the less amount of routes that you are running and then the higher percentage of um, targets you need per route. And that makes it um, a little difficult to be top end. You know, Kittle's a good blocker, but they don't – last year they didn't ask him to block at all. He had to run routes, and they just threw him the ball every time that they threw the ball. Um but uh, it, you know it worries me a little bit. But he is—he's gonna be good. He's gonna be a perennial, probably top six, seven tight end. But I don't know if he's ever going to be able to be that uh, you know tight end one, tight end two guy, um, one of the couple that are separated from everybody else, just because he's gonna have to block so much. He's gonna be good though. I think he is a beast. Um, but it's like you know. I liked Noah Fant in this class simply because he's not going to be blocking. They're not going to ask him to block. He's going to be running a lot more routes, and then obviously you can have a lower percentage of targets per route when you're running a shit ton of routes. Um, I'm going to look over here. Uh, Sean Coffey says, Jesse James have any value this season? And I think he's going to he's going to have that similar like vulture role. Um and could end up taking a few touchdowns from Hawkinson and Galladay because he's so tall that he does have that uh, red zone appeal. Um, but he's he's not going to be a guy that you're going to start in fantasy um, unless Hawkinson is out, I guess. You might, you might start him if you need to. But, you know, this is a guy – he had a couple of uh, games last year that looked pretty good, but he only had like 29 targets on the year. So it seemed like he'll get two touchdowns, kind of like uh, what was his name from uh, Jacksonville um, that was there forever. Oh, um, Mercedes, Mercedes Lewis. Lewis. Like, you know, yeah, he, he, he was would, only good in London. He would, he would have like two, three touchdowns in a game every year for like nine 10 years and it's like why isn't this guy more consistent but they just you know that's just the type of guy that he was um but yeah i don't i don't see any value there from a fantasy standpoint i think he's a better nfl player than he is a fantasy player um brad what is the talk ben out of detroit about jesse james 
Well, and and when they went into the off season, you know, Detroit was determined not to have another 2018 where they miss miserably on anybody that they wanted at tight end. So, you know, they spent a little bit more money than they probably should have to bring Jesse James in, um, you know, and but they like him. I mean, he's not, you know, like you said, he's a, a good NFL player. Um, you know, for me, it's a, if you're playing like a best ball situation, I mean, I guess, you know, if the roster's deep enough, you could roster him, but I'm not seeing anybody rostering Jesse James in any of the leagues I'm in. Uh, you know, he's one of those guys that if Hawkinson gets hurt, then yep, he'll have value, you know, because he is big and, and tall and has a very wide arms, uh, wingspan. And, you know, once you get to those goal line situations, I could easily see, you know, them putting, Hawkinson, Jesse James, and even a guy that they've been talking about a lot in camp, Isaac Nada, which is a rookie this year, uh, you know, put three tight ends out on the field and, you know, maybe do a little play action and pick whichever one's, you know, got the short cornerback on them, you know, and just throw it up and let them jump for it, um, you know. But I'm not rostering Jesse James unless there's an injury. What about you, Rob? Anything? I think a no, lot has been said no. about James. Yeah, you know, he had 33 targets last year in Pittsburgh. Um, I don't see him being very relevant in Detroit other than uh, you read that he's a really good guy, so he's probably a nice uh, mentor and a good guy in the locker room, but that's not going to win you any fantasy championships. So keep him, on the, keep him on the sidelines. All right. I think, I think we're going to just go ahead and leave running back for last because I think the most exciting player, personally, I think, on uh, Detroit is a running back, so we'll just – We'll just go into the wide receivers, and we've got uh, Kenny Galladay, who is the the top in value for the Lions, and mm -hmm. then um, Marvin Jones, and then after that, it gets a little uh, it gets a little meek. Um, what I'm I'm trying to look right here. I got to pull my Lions back up because I was looking at something else. Galladay is the 40th player drafted overall in Dynasty. Rob, do you yes, like sir. him at 40, or are you uh, thinking that's a little bit overvalued? I think it is overvalued. And when I when I pulled up ADP earlier today and was looking at um, this division more so than just the Lions, guys that I found... After Galladay, Calvin Ridley, Cooper Cup, Mike Williams, Chris Godwin, DJ Moore, all off the board after Galladay. I think I want all of them before I want Kenny Galladay. Yeah, I my list goes even longer than that. So let's say I see Tyler Boyd and Corey Davis. Those two are two I would definitely want over him, and maybe even Sammy Watkins. I'm looking at Watkins. I'm looking at Allen Robinson all the way down at 67. Um, um I don't know if I'm there with you on that one. Oh, absolutely. Um, when he leaves Chicago. But yeah, but, I mean, Cooper Cup. <laughs> when he leaves Chicago, I'm telling you guys, you guys, you want to laugh now, but you never look at a first year in a new system. I'm telling you guys right now, Allen Robinson will outscore Kenny Galladay this year. Um, if you said Anthony Miller, I might agree with you. I think just Anthony Miller is just perfect for that offense. Oh, they both are. Just wait. I'm telling you. Um, we'll talk about them when the Bears come around, though. <laughs> we will talk about them when the Bears come around. Uh, <laughs> anyways, I, I'm with Rob. I do think that he's overvalued um, mm -hmm. right now. I think that, you know, we, we, we named a bunch of guys. I definitely think he's probably at least like 8 to 10, 12 picks early, um, in my opinion. So, Brad, you said a couple people that were behind him there, so I'm assuming you think he's – at least slightly oh, yeah. overvalued? He's, he's Well, I think he's way overvalued. I mean, the, the tough thing, you know, especially with that offense is they're going to look to get big plays. So Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones are both going to stretch the field, and that's really not going to give the – I mean, each week one of them is going to have a really good week, and one of them is probably not going to look so good. It's just That's just not – I want consistency. Calvin Ridley will give me consistency. Uh, I probably am not touching Julian Edelman for the most part. You know, Cooper Cup will give you consistency. Mike Williams, I love. Chris Godwin, I'm not as excited about him as most people are. DJ Moore, I like. Tyler Lockett, I like. Tyler Boyd, I mean, I probably, you know, based on the Roto Heat rankings, I probably wouldn't take him before, you know, 75. I mean, I'd probably take him above Sterling Shepard. 
Oh wow! So you've got him like three rounds. Too. Yeah, he's like way, he's way you know way overvalued in my mind. And and let's just say, and I don't know, Rob, where were you at? Yeah. Like, did you think he was a round early, two rounds early? Where were you at with that? I think he's a round or two. And again, I go back to I look at DJ Moore at fifty three, and he's at forty. So I can I can slide past Galladay, take DJ the next round, and then wait for Galladay coming back the other way if it's a guy I really want to target. Yeah, so I just I just want to say I, I was thinking a round to two rounds. Um, I was a little conservative because I was afraid it was just going to be like Bears hate. Um, <laughs> people were going to be like, oh, it's just because you're biased because you're a Bears fan. And then the Lions fan comes out and he's like, he's three rounds too early. So I just want to <laughs> put that out there that the Lions fan uh, thinks he's three rounds too early. Um, <laughs> Well, absolutely. I mean, Cortland Sutton at 74, he's a guy that I love. Like, I've loved Cortland Sutton ever since he came out. I mean, he's a guy that I would I would just sit and wait to take him and Dante Pettis before I would take, you know, and that's, you know, 72 and 74. So at least 75 for me. Okay, so me personally, I was already thinking this offseason, especially in, in redraft situations. I think even in redraft, people are thinking Galladay. I mean, I think he's – been going in the the fourth and fifth round in redrafts. I would rather have Marvin Jones at his price. Uh, um, yeah. You know, in in dynasty, it's a little bit tougher because he is a little bit older. Um, but I would rather skip him, get some of the other guys that we talked about, and and drop down and take Marvin Jones, who has when when healthy, him and Stafford have had a connection. I was a little bit underwhelmed at the way Galladay performed when Marvin Jones was out last year. Mm-hmm. I w- won't take away the fact that literally they were picking up guys off the street to throw in because they had, you know, so many injuries at wide receiver. Um, you know, and then there was uh, what they brought in what was it Bruce Ellington came in yeah. off the yeah. street and I think, he had, I think he had 11 targets in his first game. Yeah, and you know they were having they were having a lot of trouble. So I he didn't have much help. So I'm not gonna like put it all on Galladay. I do think Galladay is gonna be a good player in the NFL. Um, I just I my over uh, my reason of him being overvalued is just the guys that are going behind him. Um, but I would skip all that and I would go to Marvin Jones. Um, I don't know what the talk's been out of Detroit about him though, Brad. So maybe you can fill us in. Um, is the guy healthy? Does he look good? He's healthy and they're not, they don't want to risk injury. You know, the guy's a seasoned vet. So they've, um, he did work in the, he worked in the scrimmage yesterday. Um, he was out there and he caught a couple passes on the first drive. It it felt very, uh, very preseason esque where he played a little bit and then he was out immediately. Um, so he's, he's healthy. He's completely good, but they're not going to work him any harder than they have to, because they want to make sure he's ready for, you know, week one. Um, you know, the tough thing in, in it is they still have the same issue they had last year. They have a bunch of nobodies. They signed Danny Amendola, you know, Jermaine Curse. They drafted Travis Fulgham in the sixth round. And then the rest of their depth chart is a bunch of nobodies. Tommy Lee Lewis, Brandon Powell, Andy Jones, uh, Chris Lacey. You know, it's like, who? I mean, none of these guys are going to be fra- fantasy relevant. And it feels to me like if Jones or Galladay goes down, you're in trouble. Yeah, it, it, it would get rough there. Rob, what's your uh, opinion on Marvin Jones? Well, last season, last season, pardon me, prior to his injury, he was sitting at wide receiver 27. You know, he did have his uh, top 12 wide receiver season in 2017. I don't see him as a, as a wide receiver one or a wide receiver two, but I think he's a very complimentary piece of that offense. If Kenny Galladay is going to be drawing the top cornerback each week, especially those four games each year, the two Minnesota, two Chicago games. I think he can make a difference there. Um, I love his value. Like ADP 92 wide receiver 40, he's blowing that away. But uh, he's not something I'm going to bank on on a week-to-week basis. I think, like Brad said, it's going to it's going to be the hit and miss with those two guys. One week someone pops, the other one doesn't. Um, but he's absolutely a guy I have on my roster. In fact, I own him in quite a few leagues, and I like him. Well, I will say that I, you know, I was looking at his ADP. Obviously, it's going to be different in redraft. Um, I don't know. I find it tough at 92 in Dynasty unless 
unless you find yourself in an absolute like must win position to take him that high, um, I think your roster construction has to be um, it has to be in a way that you're in a win now. I I'm only like targeting him personally in um, redraft situations where um, I'm not giving up you know years because I don't know how many years he's got left in the in, in the tank. So I do want to say fair. that because um, uh, uh, Paul did mention some about that being high for um, dynasty, and I agree. <clears throat> Um, so Brad went through a bunch of guys that they brought in for wide receiver. Um, the only one like I could see, and this is because, you know, Bruce Ellington had some, some value out of the slot is, uh, curse. Like, I, I mean, if you can get him for free, I think that he could have some weeks, especially if one of these guys goes down, um, where, where you could get some value out of them. And I'm sorry, I keep Brad's video just keeps like changing sizes on me and I keep trying to fix it without being noticed, but i um, not working very well. Um, so, <laughs> so that would be the only guy like out of the names you said, I know there's uh, who was the rookie last year that got a lot of hype towards the end of the year. Um, right. Um, well, Brandon, Brandon Powell, Brandon is Powell a guy that they the like, guy. but I'm not. I'm not really excited about him. Jermaine Curse is the guy that you know. He knows Bevel's system really well. Uh, I think he would be. He would have value this year. You know, Amendola could have value this year too. Quite honestly, but I'm just not. I'm not interested in rostering either one of them. Travis Fulgham, the sixth round pick, though, he's a guy that I would stash just because you know everything I've heard so far this this off season is that he plays well. He's getting better at running routes. He catches the ball nicely, and the dudes. Uh, under four four speed. I mean, he's just a, a burner. He's very fast. Um, how many slots do they have in their offense? They do they have, do they run double slots? I mean, how are you gonna how are you gonna have Amendola and Curse? I I feel like those guys aren't gonna go there to to like split reps. Do they run a lot of double slots in that offense? <sighs> no, not really. <laughs> it's 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 pretty funny that they have two guys filling the same role. It feels like one of them is going to win the job during camp, and the other one will be cut. They just start Amendola, let him get hurt, and then bring Curse in. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, Amendola does have that injury history, but uh, there are a lot of offenses that are starting to implement double slots, um, just like double tight ends and, and everything. So uh, I was just curious if that was something that they that they do. See, every time you reach for your camera – it well, it's weird because like it's like flickering. I'm like this. I'm gonna have to. I bought a like a like a hundred dollar HD camera, and I'm gonna have to figure out why it's why it does that. Like it. I think you look fantastic. That hundred hundred bucks well spent, brother. All right, Stop Rob. Flickering. Curse yes, Amendola, Brandon yeah. Powell. This uh, other guy I forgot his name of that Brad mentioned that went in like the sixth round. Any of them? You're you're. Looking to add to the back end of your rosters? No, but I will. I will say if Amendola is free, I'll take a shot. Fifty-nine of receptions on seventy-nine targets in Miami with Tannehill and Brock Osweiler throwing him the football. If if he can stay healthy and he can stay on the field, I think he can help you a little bit. So if he's free at the back end, I'll take a shot at him. But uh, other than that, no, I don't really have much interest in those guys at all. All right. Well, then let's get into this last group. Uh, running back, the perennial PPR back is now in Denver, I believe, right? Yep. Uh, yep. Riddick, Theo Riddick, it was released and then signed with Denver, and now it looks like Carry On, CJ Anderson, and Zach Zenner are the three guys there, right? Well, Brad, don't forget who, rookie Ty the Johnson. Rookie? There he is. Ty Johnson. Oh. Um, I don't, I don't know much about Ty Johnson, so I will let you, why don't you fill everybody in on Ty Johnson in case they're unfamiliar like I am? Um, he, think of, think of Stefan Diggs speed. You know, he's a kid from Maryland, just like Diggs was. He's super fast. Uh, he isn't afraid to go between the tackles, but he can hit the corner and really take it to the house on any occasion. And if you actually, 
A perfect example of what he can do is um, against Michigan last fall. First, first kick to him, dude, because uh, he returned kicks to just beat everybody. I mean, he is so fast, and it doesn't. You don't always think about it because a lot of times Maryland has a crappy offense and they run the ball in weird directions. They they don't have the offensive line. They really need to bounce it outside. But Ty Johnson is just so fast, and the one thing that you're seeing a lot in camp now is he catches the ball well. Um, a lot of the reporters and in, in articles that I've been reading is the Riddick move is because Ty Johnson has better hands than they thought he did. Uh, so, you know, CJ Anderson and carry on Johnson, Zach Zenner is kind of a, an, he's always there. Like he's just kind of the guy uh, that people like, but I don't see him really. I don't see much from Zenner, you know, Ty Johnson's a guy that I would target and stash on my taxi squad uh, everywhere I can. I think I have maybe in three or four leagues right now uh, stashed. Definitely somebody to keep an eye on um, because carry on doesn't stay healthy. Uh, and, you know, they're going to need extra running backs because they're going to pound the rock with their level like crazy. So, Rob. Yep. What did, like, our viewership dropped off real bad there. So, apparently. You just said my name and they left? Yeah, it's like, boom, gone. Yeah, uh, it's understandable. <laughs> Um, what are you doing with this running back core? My, um, love for carry on Johnson borders on unhealthy. I absolutely love him. I would not be surprised if he was a top 12 running back this year and for years to come. He was basically not touched in the first two weeks. They let plotter LeGarrette Blunt, uh, run for 2.6 yards per carry for, for those first two games. They finally gave him the rock in the third game, and he put up their first 100-yard rushing game in 70 games for the Lions. He ended up being running back 14 in weeks 3 through 11. Uh, unfortunately, he was hurt in week 11. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the guy saw, like, you know, 65, 70 targets to, comp- to add into his running ability. And the key to me for him is he got, he's got to get some work down by the goal line. He had 17 attempts inside the 20 last year. And he had two inside the five. So if he can start to get a little bit of work down where you know you can make some money, I think he's going to be a perennial top 12 running back. I absolutely love him. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I agree. I definitely love carry on too. Uh, mm-hmm. I just, you know, the, the injury history going all the way back to college. Um, I mean, I do want to say that it was on this episode about a year ago. I don't know the exact date. But I said that Carry on Johnson would get a hundred yard, hard, hundred, blah, hundred yards rushing in the first three games. You definitely it, did. I remember that. Everybody called me nuts. I was crazy. There's no way he's not the guy. They brought him Blunt. They they um, had Riddick there. Um, there there was a hundred reasons why I was wrong. And Brad, what week was it? that he ran for 100 yards for the first time? It was week three. Week three, baby. Week three. And, and then the I profit. think it was and I think it was week six, he put up 158 against the Dolphins. <laughs> so they hadn't done it in 70 games, and he did it in twice in, I think, three or four weeks. Yeah. I'm the prophet. When I say something, it happens. So just listen to me. Um, no, uh, that was just one of the few times that I was right last year. So, um, I'll eat it up and enjoy it. Um, uh, the video did go out guys. So uh, at least on Facebook, we're going to finish out this. And then if you, um, if you missed it, you can fast forward on podcast and listen to the running back talk and, uh, we'll, you know, we'll have that for you. But, uh, I'm, I'm stashing Zenner wherever I can get him. I think they like Zenner. I think he looked really good at the end of last year. Um, yeah, he did. He could potentially be the guy that gets the majority of carries if carry on would go down. Um, and he's cheap, but, you know, CJ's cheap too. Um, so, uh, but but Zenner, obviously, I think he's got a, a, a more years ahead of him. And he could be one of those guys that when he switches teams, gets an opportunity. Um, if carry on does stay healthy. So I really like Zenner at his price. Um, what are your thoughts on Zenner, Brad? Because, you know, obviously you're the Detroit guy. 
Um, do you think that he might be ahead of C.J. Anderson for touches if carry-on would go down? You know, I, I can't imagine a situation that he would, but Zach Zenner continues to prove everybody in Detroit wrong. I mean, you know, he came in and, and nobody really expected much out of him, but he, he gives me the vibe of like, you know, and I'll compare Detroit to New England as always because they seem very similar in a lot of ways, but uh, Rex Burkhead, you know, Rex Burkhead always has those few weeks where he shows up and pisses everybody off because he's successful and then everybody picks him up and then he does nothing. Zach Zenner does that too. I mean, we saw it last year. All of a sudden he came out of nowhere, had a few good weeks, went back to yeah. nowhere, you know. Yeah. Um, so he's – you have to have insurance. Carry on Johnson gets hurt. I mean, just it's inevitable, um, you know. But long term, I don't think either of – CJ or Zach Zenner is kind of like the guy to own. I think they're more of a handcuff in case of injury. And, you know, I would look elsewhere in that case and just leave him on the free in the waiver wire. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I tend to disagree just a little bit. Um, you know, I, the, the Rex Burkhead deal, if he would be in any other city than New England right now, he would be getting, he would be getting more consistent work, I think. Yeah. And, and obviously this system in Detroit is kind of like New England. Um, so that's why I think that maybe Zenner could get some action outside of Detroit in the future. Um, but I don't, you know, it's not guaranteed by any stretch of the imagination. It's just this is a guy that's free. Running backs do tend to uh, come out of nowhere sometimes and, and, and gain value. So if uh, if I can put well, him there. Was... And he was sitting out in free agency last year. Nobody signed him. I mean, it's either Detroit or nothing for Zach Zenner. I mean, he well, was sitting out okay. for a while. Well, that was before he showed out at the end of the year, though. I mean, he showed that he could be productive at the end of the year. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pull up the stats here and see exactly what it was. But he never really got much of a shake before this new regime came in either. So it's hard to tell what a guy can do. Um, until he gets an opportunity, um, but I thought that I, he looked I think, damn good. I think he's got he's got remote value, but in all honesty, if Carry On goes down, um, I'm looking on another roster to fill that hole. I'm I'm not handcuffing Carry On with Zach Zenner, to be honest. Well, I'm not yeah, cuffing it's... Carry On. I'm getting Zach Zenner everywhere. And I don't yeah, have, but, I wish I had carry on everywhere, but I don't like, yeah, I just don't see Zenner being well, like, when are you starting him? Seriously? Well, and, and Zenner in 2016, he, he started to show signs of life, you know, cause they drafted him in 2015. He really didn't see much action. 2016, they wound up giving him like, you know, 88 carries and he only averaged like 3.8 yards or something like that. If I remember correctly. Yeah. But that, that was during a stretch where no running back had a chance in Detroit either. I mean, that's, we that's fair. If we're, if mm-hmm. we're going to be fair with it and 88, 88 carries is a very small sample size too. Um, you know, like for example, let's go ahead and see game logs, 2016, right? Um, looking at game logs, Attempts. So he had 14, 12, and 20 attempts. And when he got over 14, he typically averaged over four yards per carry. Um, except for when they played against Green Bay in week 16 um, or week 17, he had he averaged three and a half that game. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he went 12 for 67 and one, 14 for 58. Those are both over four yards per carry. Um, but most of them were three for 12, seven for nine, uh, against Philly who in 2016 had a good defense. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but, but then anytime that he got carry seven for 36, nine for 40, it was the, it was the times where he got like two to three, you know, four carries that, that really hurt his average that year. (coughs) Um, and those all add up, you know, some running backs, you got to get them going downhill. And then, you know, the, then then they get better as the game progresses. They wear down the defense, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not going to argue that Zag Zenner is going to be the next, you know, monster running back. But I feel like he, he showed out last year. Um, he's free. 
And if anything happens to carry on, that's the guy that I think that I'm going with. Uh, you know, he went 12 for 54, 10 for 45, 8 for 45, yeah. 21 for 93. Um, you know, he almost went over 100 yards last year. And they could have had two different guys go over 100 yards in the same season after going five seasons without having one. Yeah, in, <laughs> fair, in fairness, that was against a Packers team in Week 17 that had long quit before that. But it's still it's still True. 93 rushing but yards in the NFL. You don't you don't think they had five Week 17s before last year that teams had quit? And <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? I like I can't like, really argue that. So that's true. They play Week 17 every year, and they didn't have a hundred yard rusher in any of those. So um, Roger, but anyways, Roger that. But anyways, I just thought that he looked really good. He, you know, those thir- weeks 13 through 16, he progressively. Uh, well, he didn't progressively get more work. He was around that 10 to 12 range for three of the weeks. And then when he got the, the touches in week 17, he looked really good. That's just the guy, like, I don't know if C.J. Anderson's the guy that I'm going to wear, you know, that I'm going to put my um, faith into if Carrion would go down. Um, when when Zag Zenner gets work, he tends to produce. So um, I could definitely see them – going with him if something would happen so i just feel like it's a free guy yeah i don't normally cuff but this guy's free he doesn't yeah. cost you anything and you know i play on in leagues with deep rosters so if i need somebody to fill out a roster i want somebody that's one injury away um from from getting you know even if he gets 15 carries he's probably gonna give you some consistent work and he actually had more targets in 2016, he showed that he could catch the ball. I think he was, what, 18 for 23 um, mm-hmm. on opportunities there. So um, he doesn't have stone hands for a guy that's a, a kind of a, um, you know, downhill runner. So that's that's my thought there. Um, I think okay, we that, talked more that, about That's Zach the Center. most anyone has ever talked about Zach Zinner on a podcast since he broke into the league. Um, I'm going to have to make sure we need to get everybody on the team to tweet him so that he'll listen. Totally. Um, because he's probably like, damn, man, I didn't even know people talked about me. Um, <laughs> so we're going to, hey, we're definitely going to have to tweet that out. He did, we'll have some... rush... he did have as many rushing touchdowns as carry on last year for whatever that's worth. We'll set up some Roto heat gear so you can I represent. Didn't... I didn't even know that he had his, are you they kidding? both had, they both had three rushing touchdowns last year. Mm-hmm. How many uh, receiving touchdowns did uh, what's his name have though? Uh, KJ or Zenner? Yeah, ca- carry on. Um, that I don't have top off the top of my head. One moment, please. Hold the line, caller. He was thirty-two of thirty-nine targets for one touchdown. So he, so he scored literally four scored... times last year. Yeah, but that comes with a bad offense too. So, anyways. Uh, Zenner has a 73% catch percentage in his career. Welcome to Zach Zenner Radio. <laughs> Zach Zenner. I'm going to have to change the image from uh, totally. carry on to Zach Zenner. Um, we'll just morph some ZZ Top logo in there. I'm going we'll to do a Zach Zenner breakdown video for YouTube and just become this guy's like Uber fan. <laughs> um, okay, so... We're looking at this ADP, Lions ADP, and I think these answers are fairly simple just because of the way um, that guys line up, but we ask them every episode. So right now, we've got four players in to- inside the top 100. We've got two players in the ADP that are outside of the top 100, and one of them is CJ Anderson, who was drafted one time at 185 um, and comes in as our 217th player overall. If one of these guys is going to drop out of the top 100 solely, who is it going to be? I think we're all going to say the same guy. Well, see, I'm hoping you went to me last because I'm trying to pull it up right now. Okay, we'll go with uh, Brad. Who's dropping out of the 100? Yeah, got to be Marvin Jones. That's who I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I, honestly, I don't need to pull it up to know that. I agree. He's sitting at 92, so it's not like it would be a far yeah, ball, I, so they're that... like Just the way their team lays out, Like the the nice bit about this is if Hawkinson was like 101 
It would make yeah. it really, really simple, but he's at 99, so he's not going to be able to move into the top 100. He's going to be there um, this year and next year, and probably for eight seasons after that. Um, okay, so out of all the Lions players that are either on this list or not on this list, who's got the best chance of – uh, and we're not even going to say get into the top 100 because I don't think any of them have a chance. Just who's going to gain the, the most value um, of the guys that are not in the top 100? Um, Brad, why don't you go ahead and give us your guy? Um, well, I mean, obviously Stafford, you know, at 158, you would think that he should be able to bounce up closer to the 100 mark if he has a full healthy season and – you know, you see his his you see his targets healthy as well. You know, uh, Marvin Jones was hurt most last year, um, so I would expect it to be Stafford. But there's not a lot to work with here. <laughs> <laughs> Sullivan, don't take my guy. Oh, jeez. Biggest mover as in terms of who jumps up the most? Yeah, just who do you think? Uh, uh that's outside the top 100 could, could move and they don't have to be on this list. They could be Brandon Powell. It could be, yeah. Um, you know, curse or Amendola just who's gonna, who's, who's gonna be the most valuable outside of this top 100. Biggest mover will be, um, the rookie running back will jump up the most. He's not going to get into the top 100, but he's, it's Ty Johnson. Is that correct, Brad? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> he's bigger than a guy. Can't even remember the guy's, guys. I'm calling my shot. I don't even know his name um, because I do think CJ Anderson is going to be released at some point this season, the same as he was in Carolina. So I think the kid's going to get an opportunity to do some, do some damage and at least make a name for himself. That's going to drive him up the rankings. The only other one that I can see making a big jump is, is Hawkinson, but I, he doesn't have much room to go because overall he does position wise. He doesn't. Um, well, I'm going with Zach center. I just, I'm just gonna ride this bus. I'm gonna go yep. to Zag Zenner, and I think if if Carryon goes down, Zag Zenner's gonna get the work, and he's going to be successful again. I don't even know what his contract looks like, but hopefully, I want to know what his ADP is. Hopefully, it's a, it's non-existent. Mm, he doesn't it's, have any. It, yeah. When you look at his ADP, it says free. That's what it says. So that's why I'm going with him. Um, I think he's going to have some value this year. And if I'm wrong, then that was my bold take for 2019. So, Brad, you do this sales pitch thing at the end of your episodes a lot better than I do because I'm just kind of like I want to get the – I, I, I want to get out of here. Got call. I, I got to call Zach. I got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I got to go. Zach paid me for this. This is a sponsored episode, <laughs> sponsored by Zach Zenner. Um, uh, why don't you Why don't you give the sales pitch and get us out of here? All right. So, and, and fun fact about Zach Zenner is his nickname is Big Z and Doc. So, just FYI, I don't Big know if that, that makes you makes you feel any better. So, I do, I do know another Big Z, <laughs> Carlos Zambrano. Um, and I do want to <laughs> say, tomorrow is the Kansas City Chiefs. So if you're sick of bad teams that we've covered early on here, um, I think we've had the Chargers and then three bad teams. And uh, if, I wish that you could see um, Brad's face right now, but our video on Facebook went out. Um, uh, we've got a team that should be pretty good coming up tomorrow. So uh, look out for that. Brad, take us out of here. All right. So with that being said, we thank you guys for, for listening in. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you guys. Uh, make sure you jump on Discord. Make sure you jump on the Facebook group. Search for Roto Heat. Um, also find us wherever you get your content, whether it's on iTunes with Sully's Two Cents. We've got we've got all sorts of great content from Sully. We got the Heat Seekers podcast that are going to be on there. Uh, jump on Twitch TV Twitch TV slash Roto Heat, uh, and you'll get our live streams every time we go live. So whether that's Thursday night with the roundtable, whether it's whatever Heat Seekers episode we're on. Uh, whatever random day of the week Rick decides to jump on and start talking about all things Detroit Lions and Zach Center. Um, we also want to want to ask you guys to uh, to partner with us. Go to rotoheat.com. Uh, we have all of this ADP that we've been talking about is up on there. 
Uh, it's only like two ninety nine a month, and you're getting a ton of great statistics. You're getting a ton of great analytics. Uh, we are constantly trying to add and update and and give you give you the paying customer uh, what you want. So uh, I'm working on IDP analytics, and we're trying to get that up for those of you that are crazy enough to like defensive fantasy football like I do. Um, so you know we would encourage you guys to to come check out rotoheat.com. Uh, we've got a ton of great writers, and we continue to add more writers every day. Uh, so, you know, yeah, that's it. Jump on there. Jump on Twitter. You can find all of us on there. Uh, start with Roto, at Roto Heat Fantasy, and you'll find the rest of us that way. Uh, we thank you guys for joining us. Rob. Best two ninety nine you'll ever spend, my friends. Skip that coffee Monday morning. Drop two ninety nine. Become a VIP member. You'll never look back. Especially, especially with the DFS content coming up. We are going to have a phenomenal year. And Zach Zanner is not in the top 500 ADP on MFL. And people, that means like 250 people are wrong. <laughs> or more than more than that, but I mean, every draft, 250 people are wrong. And yep. uh, uh, is, is there any last words? Other than, other, I just wanted to say, I've been looking forward to being on with both of you guys for quite a while, and we finally made it happen. So thanks very much for this. It was a ton of fun. And uh, anytime I'm available, let me know. Oh, the Canadian went soft to, to end this episode. Thank you. Can you, you thank feel you. the love tonight? Thanks, and boys. Muted. <laughs>